How's everyone doing? Good, good. Your brain's hurt yet? Ready to learn some more information? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm Dan Rissick. I'm a developer evangelist at PubNub. And uh, I, just like Steven, I'm also here to change the world. Um, but I'm also here to help you guys learn how to change the world. And so you know, we're really interested in real-time communications. Uh, we're a real-time uh, communications company. And so I want to talk about the data channel and just kind of my findings um, definitely over the past you know, six to nine months about what we've been doing with the data channel and what we've discovered so far on the capabilities and uh, you know, how we like it. So one of the first things that I always talk to people uh, and, and our customers and different people at PubNub about is, you know, what the heck is real time? I, I say real time, you guys say real time. Uh, what does that mean? You know, is, is Facebook real time? Is Twitter real time? Uh, you know, is, is Google now real time? You know, what, what does real time mean to people? Uh, and the best analogy I have for this is, you know, right, right when Google Earth came out, a bunch of people downloaded it. It was, you know, a hot topic for everyone. And the first thing that everyone did was they found their address and they zoomed all the way down <laughs> and found, you know, your house. And you know, you probably noticed, hey, maybe my car is not in the driveway. I should probably call the cops. I think someone probably stole it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it, and it turns out, you know, why why aren't these live pictures of the Earth? And and that's the number one you know question on the FAQ is. Why aren't these live pictures? Uh, and there's a whole page explaining on why we can't pull down live images from a satellite, you know, over a thousand miles away. Um, but that's the crazy thing: is, is Google Earth isn't real time. You know, there's, there's, it doesn't say live Google Earth. It's not called real time Google Earth. People just downloaded it and they figured, hey, it's this should be real time. Uh, so you know, there's something real fundamental about real time, real time data, real time video. It's, it's the way I interact with the world today. I'm playing a game, I'm talking to people, everything is real time. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's really fundamental to our users and that carries over into the digital world as well. Uh, the next question I usually ask people is, how long is real time for your users? Uh, we get tons of different answers to this question. Uh, and, and my favorite answer is a group of Stanford people did a study on what real time means. You know, what is, how do we perceive the world in real time? Uh, and so what they did was they took a group of people and they said a sentence that didn't make sense, like all dogs are instruments. Uh, obviously not many people say that every day, so they, they measured the time it took for the brain to actually figure out when the negative reaction to that sentence was. Uh, it turns out that the time to do that was about 300 milliseconds. So you are now perceiving the world 300 milliseconds lag latency from everything that's actually happening, not to freak anyone out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, this is really fundamental to us at PubNub, and this is really fundamental to real-time communication. We think that real-time data, uh, especially, is in the, matter, in the magnitude of milliseconds, not seconds, not minutes, you know, not hours. Uh, when your users get data, they should, we should strive to get it there as fast as possible. So this is the great thing about the data channel is that it's a high performance, low latency connection to other browsers. This is one of the ways that we can start pushing the boundaries to how fast your users can get that data. Um, and this is pretty much it. I worked really hard on that animation, so I'm really proud of it. Uh, <laughs> I sat with CSS3 properties for like two hours trying to figure this out. Uh, <laughs> so. This is pretty much it. You have two browsers. They have a peer connection to each other. Uh, and the little box represents a data packet. The data can be anything. It can be you know, a Twitter handle, my latest tweet, my Facebook picture, anything. Uh, and you're just sending that directly across the web to another browser. No, there's no middle server. There's you know, no routing that has to go through other than just the internet that we know today. Uh, and this gives us a bunch of ca capabilities. So currently, it supports array buffers, blobs, and strings. Uh, array buffers and blobs are kind of the new binary types that are coming around in JavaScript. So if you've played with like the file system APIs, uh, you'll probably recognize those for storing different types of data that aren't just strings. Um, and then they, they support strings, which hopefully everyone has had a chance to take a look at. Uh, it also works in two modes. So I can send data in a reliable mode. And what this means, it, it, they're kind of synonymous with TCP and UDP. Reliable mode will make sure your packets are guaranteed in the correct order and there's no packet loss, so it sends confirmations, uh, confirmation headers for each of the packets, uh, which is a lot like how TCP works today. And this is a lot like how WebSockets work, how HTTP works, you know, how your usual browser technology works today. 
the other mode I'm really excited about is the unreliable mode. So <coughs> this is no guarantees. It's completely, you know, every through every caution to the wind and just send data as fast as possible. Uh, and this is a lot like UDP. This is, you know, technology that's been around for years, but we're just starting to see this, you know, come into the browser uh, in really great ways. And so this is the same stuff that you know, your games are using today. It's just sending data as fast as possible uh, without the extra overhead and the, and the time taking to actually confirm that those packets got there in the right order or time. So who wants to see an amazing demo for, for WebRTC data channel? A few people out there? All right. Uh, so it turns out that data actually isn't that amazing but uh, I'll try my best here. So what I'm doing here is uh, I, when I click connect, it's making a peer connection to itself. So this is my browser. Uh, it's going out and making a peer connection to itself. It, that connection can be another browser, but uh, for simplicity's sake, I just made it kind of loop around. And <laughs> when I click send, it's actually gonna take the, the data channel and just send that across the peer connection. So this is taking that string, hello, sending it out through the data channel. Um, and it's getting transported across your peer connection directly to your other browser, which in this case is itself. Uh, but you can see the latency is pretty quick there. Uh, obviously, going from my computer to my computer is pretty fast, but uh, you'll see this with other computers too. You know, this is, this is probably one of the fastest connections you can get. It's going directly from A to B. And, and that can be anything. So it can be you know, an array buffer or a blob. Um, it can also be JSON data too. So. Let's see if I can type JSON correctly. So there you go, and it's coming across the data channel, and it's actually getting spit out on the other side uh, as an object. And it turns out the code is really, really simple. So if you've used WebSockets before, uh, most of this will probably look familiar, and that's done on purpose. So they're trying to make this really simple, really familiar, just like everything else you've been using. Uh, the difference is that <coughs> in your first step, you actually set up that peer connection. So this is the part where you transfer SDPs between two peers, you actually have them connect with each other and do the handshakes and everything. Uh, once you have that though, it's actually pretty simple. You call create data channel and you pass in a label. Uh, this is really just to kind of distinguish different data channels from other ones. So if you create multiple data channels on a peer connection, uh, they'll each have a different label. And then you'll pass in your options bracket. And this is where you configure that reliable property. So if you pass in true, you'll get that TCP-like experience. Uh, if you pass in false, you'll get that, that low latency UDP-like experience. Uh, there's a few <laughs> events that come off the data channel. There's like an on open and on close that you'll get when it's actually connects and disconnects. Uh, you'll also get an on error if there's any problems. And then on message is really where you're getting the data from the other client. So that function will get called, event.data will contain your string, your, your array buffer, your blob, anything that you sent over that channel in the other client. And then to send something, you just call data channel.send, and that's where you pass in your object. Quick question. Your uh, JSON example there, was there some magic in the send, or did you actually have <laughs> intelligence on the other side to interpret that as JSON? Uh, from what I remember, I wrote that example a while ago, but from what I remember, I think I just, I'm actually using json.parse on all the messages that come over. So if it is JSON, uh, it actually turns it into an object. Uh, it, it tries to do a best guess, so it's not. That's your code, there's nothing magic in sense. Right, right. There, there's a little bit of magic in that it tries to take a guess. Um, I don't believe it actually decodes JSON for you, but you'll have to do that on the other side. Uh, so now the question on everyone's minds is, is it ready yet? Can I use this in production? Can I go home and start coding today? The great thing is that Chrome and Firefox, uh, the answer is yes. It actually works in Android and desktops for Chrome and Firefox. Uh, and this is, this is really cool. You know, my, my Android phone can now talk to my desktop, can send data back and forth. The bad part is that there's no interoperability, but I put yet there because the Chrome's actually working on getting the interoperability solved between Chrome and Firefox. Um, and I think it's been confirmed that it's kind of coming down the pipe in beta right now, uh, should be here probably within the next month. <laughs> so those two browsers will be able to talk to each other in Android and desktops. The bad part is that IE and Safari are kind of left out. The whole you know, Safari problem was with WebKit and iOS, still kind of unknown. Uh, IE Internet Explorer is also kind of an unknown, so you'll have to kind of
trying to figure out you know, when that's going to happen. Still kind of unsure. Uh, Opera, actually Opera for developers is where everything, the data channel is working, uh, still kind of working its way into production right now. Uh, so, so pretty much ready with <laughs> a little bit of caveats, kind of have to you know, pick and choose where your users lie to see uh, which is the best route to go. Uh, the other big thing I want to talk about is security. So as we've seen before, everything is mandatory secure. So uses DTLS for data security. So everything is encrypted end to end. Uh, the one thing I will say is that the focus on these things is really performance. So if you're sending, God forbid, social security numbers, uh, credit card information, peer to peer, um, may not work out for you, but if you are trying to do that stuff, I would say use some sort of encryption algorithm on top of that. Uh, you're not getting <coughs> you know, military grade security on top of your data channels. Uh, the biggest threat to your applications when using the data channel, and I think as everyone's seen with peer-to-peer -peer sharing applications, the reason why virus scanners probably have made so much money, uh, the biggest threat is other users sending malicious data. So if you have two peers talking to each other, uh, one of those could use those for, for malicious purposes. Uh, who knew? There's also a lot of other considerations. Uh, one of the big questions that people talk about with the data channel is, oh, my browsers can send data to each other. Uh, obviously, I don't need servers anymore. Awesome, so long, I'm just going to write JavaScript. Uh, I would say that there's actually the flip side of that. So you're, you're probably going to need more servers in a data channel application. You're going to need something for presence. So how do I know when a user is online or offline? Um, how do I do analytics? So the big thing is if I'm sending <laughs> a piece of data from one browser to another, there's no, that's not stored anywhere. I don't have a record of that actually happening. So if user A says, hey, user B sent me a really bad message, you have no data to go back and figure out if that actually happened. So you're going to have to do some sort of logging around that. Um, also user IDs, you know, how do I identify who's what user? Uh, if I'm using a phone and a browser, how do I identify that that's one person and not two? Uh, storage as well is a big thing. You know, keeping everything in JavaScript is probably not the best idea. You'll probably want a database at some point, so you'll need to do storage and have a server for that. Uh, multicasting with the MCUs, if, as we've seen, is a whole other issue to solve on top of that. Um, and then signaling is the big thing. So you know, how do I actually connect two users before I have a peer connection? Um, highly recommend checking out PubNub's take on that. So we do completely serverless signaling, which is pretty cool stuff. Uh, the other thing you'll run into is there's a whole new level of data to kind of think about here. So if I'm <laughs> sending a multiplayer game and I'm sending constantly you know, updates, I have to be able to process that on the JavaScript side, as well as rendering things at 60 frames a second, as well as you know, running my physics algorithms, as well as on top of them, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is actually one of the things that we ran into is we were building a file sharing application using the data channel to kind of see what the capabilities were. Uh, and we were trying to send bigger and bigger files. So we'd send a gigabyte file. Okay, it went good. Now let's send a two gigabyte file. Okay, it went good. Um, and as we started to get up there, we started to figure out that <coughs> uh, our limitation was actually, put your pitchforks down, but our limitation was actually JavaScript. Uh, you know, we actually ran into the string couldn't hold enough information for us to save a whole piece of data. Uh, so there's just a whole ton of new things that you'll run into in doing these sorts of applications where, uh, you know, you have to think about how do I store four gigabytes of information if I'm sending files between two people. Uh, it's kind of, it's a whole nother dynamic for web ap application developers. Uh, so what can we do with this technology? And in no way do I recommend building a sentient browser network of browsers that will take over the world, but hey, it's, it's a pretty neat idea. Uh, <coughs> it's definitely possible with WebRTC data channel. Stamp of approval. Uh, so this is kind of bringing out faster applications and applications that can handle more data. So now I can do my multiplayer gaming. Uh, this, this data channel technology is the same kind of stuff that you know, Battlefield's using, that Call of Duty's using, Quake 3, Doom 2, uh, go even further back than that. I mean, this is technology that's been around for years, and we're getting this in the browser. So Quake 3 remakes, I want to see them. Uh, also, file sharing. You, know, you can now send 
large pieces of data without having to host you know, thousands of different servers to be able to, to handle all this data. It's really just, you're not paying for bandwidth, you're not paying for storage, you're not paying for transfer and setting it all up. Uh, once, your de once your users can talk to each other, you can build the Napster in, in browsers, and this is already stuff that's been done so far. Um, and <laughs> there's even stuff like further on after that. Uh, anyone using a Chromecast in here right now? Anyone? And, been checking that out. Um, Chromecast is really cool. It's a little device that plugs into your TV, and you can actually play Netflix, you know, with your phone. So you can open up Netflix on your phone. You can say, "I want to play this video, but I want to play it on that TV over there," and it just does everything for you. Um, but WebRTC opens up this kind of technology. Now my phone can talk to my TV. Now my phone can talk to my computer. So, you know, why can't I use my phone as a remote control to control the video that's playing on my TV? Why can't I? see something on my phone and then send that to my computer so that when I get off the train and go to my desk, uh, everything is right there waiting for me in the browser. Um, second screen devices, content delivery. You know, we're seeing all sorts of new technology and new applications popping up with the data channel. And there's great examples of this today. <coughs> so the first example I want to show uh, is this file sharing application. And, and this is what I was talking about where uh, we actually built a file sharing application with the data channel on top of PubNub. So what I'm doing here is opening up two different clients and you'll see if, there we go. So uh, they can now see each other. So this one is seeing that the other one is online and I can choose a file to share. Let's see, there's a good one. <laughs> And now my other client can see, hey, this, this, you know, the other person now has a file to share with me. So I click Git, it opens up a data channel between the two and pipes that data directly from one browser to another and it only took 1.3 seconds. No servers uh, hosting the files, it didn't get uploaded anywhere. You know, the, the thing, if you ever use Gmail, you can only use 25 megabyte files. Uh, those limitations are gone with, with WebRTC. You know, I just shared a file from one browser to another. Uh, and there's tons of more great examples out there. <coughs> uh, the two other links I, I won't go too far into. The, the Banana Bread one is really awesome. Uh, Mozilla took Banana Bread, which is their WebGL kind of uh, almost like a first person shooter game. Uh, and took it and used uh, WebRTC data channel to make it multiplayer. So they had you know, five people who were playing against each other uh, in this 3D first person shooter game, uh, you know, all in the browser. No downloads, they didn't have to install anything. Uh, everything just worked out of the box in Firefox. So uh, if you get a chance, check that out. It's really, really cool stuff. Uh, and also another thing that kind of popped up in the community that really surprised a lot of people is this uh, pure CDN. And the idea behind it is that if I'm sitting down, uh, you know, like most of you are at your computers and you're on Facebook and the person next to you is on Facebook, uh, you know, why can't I get my CSS, my JavaScript and any other files that I'm using from that person since they're technically the closest server? Uh, in my region. So the, uh, you know, it uses WebRTC data channel to actually transfer these files much like a CDN does except between computers that, you know, are, that might be close to you. So really, really innovative, neat stuff coming out. Uh, and I, I really think this is changing the way we think about web applications, the way we think about web computing. Uh, you know, it, it changes the way users interact. Obviously, users can interact with each other, but it also changes the way, you know, web developers are going to start thinking about building applications. So, if I had the capability to, to send data in real time between clients, uh, you know, that opens up a lot of new ideas. Now, my phone can talk to my computer <coughs> and, you know, they can share data not only from they can share it from the, the cameras, they can share it from the accelerometers with phone gap. There, there's all sorts of things that you can just really build really cool stuff on top of here. So, you know, gone are the days of one client talking with four servers to get my data, but now, you know, maybe it's more like a mesh network. Maybe my client talks to three other people in the room and two servers to build that web page and build that experience. So that's all I have. Taking any questions, uh, there's my Twitter, GitHub, check us out on GitHub. Um, and then also <coughs> PubNub has their, we built a, like a WebRTC kind of API framework, much like PureJS out there. So um, there's a link to that. And then 
yeah, check out PubNow and, and WebRTC. Thanks. Uh, I, it's it's pretty pretty darn fast in my opinion. I mean, if you think of download, it, it was a pretty large image. I forgot how large it was. It's actually like almost like a wallpaper type background, um, and and there will be a little bit of latency, but uh, I think it's it's much faster than a lot of the other stuff that we've seen today. Yeah. So so the question was, what about drop connections? If I have a phone and I go through a tunnel. Uh, you know what what happens then uh, the unfortunate thing is that like you will just it'll try and reconnect um, as much as it can but you will get lost data if you don't try and handle those use cases so you really want to make sure that you're you're binding to the on opens and the closes and you know learning when you know when the data channel opens and when the data channel closes then I know I need to send my data off to a server, or then I need to store it in memory for when I do have a connection and reconnect uh, later on. So you, you'll have to add your own kind of logic to take care of those cases. Uh, but all the tools are there, and all the events are there to actually handle those cases. Uh, the, so I haven't really worked on any games in, with the data channel yet. I've mostly been doing kind of file sharing and chatting stuff. Uh, it's really going to depend on your connection. So, I mean, if you look at games today, you, you can get 5v5 in a room all playing against each other. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do that in, in the browser as well. It's not, there's no like arbitrary limits. It's really just almost like a pass through to this UDP technology that, the, the, like I said, the games are using the same exact technology today. Maybe, you know, it's a lot more sophisticated for a game, but uh, there's really no limits on what the browser can do with that. So you can probably get 5v5. It's, like I said, it's all going to depend on your, your network, and you're going to have to do latency checks to see how long things are taking between here and, the, and somewhere else and do all that. But I'd say at least 10 people, probably more. Uh, so like I said, the limits are really going to be on the network. Uh, you know, most of the limits that you'll see You'll, you'll hit network capability limits much faster than you'll hit anything in JavaScript or the browser limits wise. So if I have a bad connection, that's going to be your limiting factor. Um, you're not going to hit anything in the JavaScript side other than maybe interrupts in the JavaScript VM that's running. Uh, but you can get pretty, pretty, pretty fast. I haven't done any benchmarks, so I can't speak to any numbers. But there's, I've seen nothing that is going to limit you on the JavaScript side. So my very uh, limited understanding right now is that if the computer you're trying to establish a peer connection with is behind a firewall, mm -hmm. um, then the ICE framework will fall back on a turn server and yeah. the data will get routed through the turn server. Yeah. Um, so my question is, how often is that the case? And, and when that does happen, uh, does that happen every time the computer is behind a firewall? And if that is the case, um, is it still peer to peer at that point? Um, so the, there's some really great studies out there already on turn versus stun and when each one happens. I don't know the latest numbers, so don't quote me on it. But I think turn is somewhere, somewhere around 18%, maybe even less. So most of the time, you're actually using stun. You're making the pair connections uh, successfully. And a lot of people say firewalls. You know, Everyone has a firewall. That's not going to limit your stun peer connections. Uh, on, in the most common use cases, it's, it's more talking about those super secure, you know, sitting in a military base somewhere firewall. That's going to be the limiting factor for when it's falling back on those turn servers. So I'd say you know, most of the time, in most of your use cases on mom and pop's computer, you're not going to have, you're going to end up using stun. And it's going to make successfully that peer-to-peer -peer connection uh, without the latency from a turn server. Uh, yeah, so the they're not really competing in the sense uh, WebSockets is really the client-to-server model, whereas WebRTC is really the peer-to-peer -peer model. So it's kind of different models of thinking about how I'm sending data. Uh, WebSockets is really TCP only, so you're not going to get that low latency UDP connection that you'll find with WebRTC. Um, that being said, you can probably download the, the Google has you know, graciously opened up a lot of the source code for WebRTC. So if you can actually get that on a, on a server and create a connection between a server and a browser you know, using that source code, then you might be able to get a, a lower latency connection.
specify? Yeah, it's, it's going to be something on the peer connection level. So that's where you're going to start using, if you have an MCU that can actually multicast for you, uh, that's where you'll get your multicasting ability. There's nothing built into the data, the data channel layer that will allow you to do that. Um, that being said, you can use other things like WebSockets, like long polling to a server and have a server. You know, multicasting stuff is something that has been kind of, multicasting data is something that's kind of been done a lot already, so you can definitely find uh, ways to do that today without using the, the peer connection. Cool, great. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks.